Hey, Martin here with another Tabletop Talk. This time we are going to be looking at infantry movement during the movement phase and it's going to be a bit of a deep dive. Almost certainly this is a video that's going to be better for someone who's somewhat new to Advanced Squad Leader or completely new. Uh, but we're going to go into a lot of detail about movement and where I miss things at, I'm, I'm going to tell you that we're missing those out as well. So basically, just to give you an idea of what we're doing here, you'll notice there's, um, there's timestamps at the bottom, so if you want to jump to things or go back to things, that's going to be easy for you to do. We're going to be looking at how far units can move, how you can boost their movement factors, uh, what are the various movement costs for the different things that uh, different places that you might try to go. We're going to uh, quickly explain bypass movement, how you carry things, how that can affect how far you can move, and then we look at some special types of movement, dash, assault move, and minimum move. Let's have a look at some of the units. Okay, first thing to recognise is that move, infantry move with uh, what we call movement factors. Uh, I'm going to find a basic uh, Russian squad here. So uh, a first line squad from any nationality has four movement factors. Uh, first line, second line, elite, nearly, whether it's a squad, whether it's a half squad, they have four movement factors. So very, very straightforwardly, this first line squad can move one, two, three, four. They can move four hexes across open terrain. Notice all of this is open and clear terrain. That's going to change. We'll have a look at the different movement factor costs for other terrain later on. Um, conscripts. So conscripts are obviously less experienced. Um, they can only move three. They've got three movement factors. One, two, three. Single man counters have six. So this single man counter can go one, two, three, four, five, six. Slight oddity, the, uh, the Russians don't have this. This is green troops. Uh, green troops are inexperienced uh, and they can, only move, they can only move three. But there is a way in which they are different to conscripts, which we'll have a look at in just a second. So the next thing is that if you have a normal squad, here we have a 667 litre US squad, and this squad is stacked with a single man counter, and if they start the movement phase together and they move together entirely, then they can all move, well, they get the, the, the squad gets the plus two bonus of the, um, of the leader. So we can go one, five, six, so they can get all the way, all the way to there. So what's the slight? The slight oddity is that that bonus. So if it's applied to a conscript, conscript squad, if we imagine that that four two six moving with this leader here, the um, the conscript squad only has three movement points. It gets a plus two bonus from their leader, so they have five in total. The way that's different with a green troop, so I guess the idea is they're like territorial troops, they've had, a bit of, they've had a bit of training, is that when they're stacked with a single man counter, they can move, they, 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 they get four movement factors plus the two bonus. So this stack here can move six, the green conscripts with the leader, um, but the conscripts with the leader, they can only move, they can only move five. So that's also the first way that you can boost the movement factors of a squad is with a leader. The second way is that you can double time. So let's have this uh, Russian squad on its own here. So we know this has got um, four movement factors. We'll, we'll pop it here. If we give it a, if we declare, and you have to do this at the beginning of the movement phase, you declare double time, you get a bonus of two movement factors. So this unit here can move one, two, three. Four, if you started to move without declaring double time, I don't, let's say we move one to there, and then we, either we've just forgotten to double time, or perhaps we might see some, something might come into view that, that changes our ideas about what we want to do, and now we want to double time, we can, but it will only add one to the movement factors, so it's now going one, two, three, four, five. Okay, whereas it would have been able to go that little bit further. Obviously, you can combine these things. So, so you can declare double time and have a leader stacked together. 
and then they can move eight. One, six, seven, eight. So that's kind of that's kind of the ways that you can combine these things. And the final method that you can use to increase movement factors is on a road. So the, the, the key thing here is the unit has to begin on a road, it has to move continually on the road, and it has to end on the road, obviously. So and then it can gain an additional point. So for example, this group here moving together as, as, as though a unit can move six uh, movement factors. One, two, three, four, five, six. And at that point, because we've been moved on the road the whole way, we can declare plus one for a movement bonus, so we can go to, to seven. If we called declare double time at the beginning, we could have got nine hexes in total. And those are the basic ways that, uh, that you can boost movement. There are other things, uh, bicycles, cavalry, skis, there are all kinds of other aspects of the game, but we're not going to be talking about those today. Now I'm going to move on to the movement factor costs of moving into different terrain types. So let's get our basic squad again. So the first one we're going to do is woods. Woods are very, very straightforward. Instead of one for open terrain, woods cost two. Buildings, whether they are wooden or stone, cost two. Buildings are a little bit more complex and a bit more interesting than woods because, of course, they can have more than one level. Buildings like this, single hex buildings with a small um, dot in the middle, the same size as the, as the normal ones, they're one level building, so they only have a ground floor. M9 here only has a ground floor. But multi-hex buildings like this, they have two levels, a ground floor and level one. So um, a, a, if there is no stairwell symbol, this is, a, this is a stairwell symbol, the white dot in the center there. If there is no stairwell si uh, symbol, every hex of that building has a stairwell. So I can move two into this building here, and then I can pay one movement factor to move up, this, essentially go up the stairs, put a level one counter on him, and he is now at level one. It cost him three, two to move into the building, and one to move upstairs. I can also move across the build, across the building upstairs. So it's assumed that this is perhaps a, the sort of building, like offices or whatever. So once you're upstairs, you can move across into that into that hex on level one. And you can move from there, you can move back down for one movement point. So going up or down the stairs costs one movement point. Other buildings that have stairwell symbols like this one here, I can move into this building for two, but there is only a stairwell in the hex where the stairwell symbol is shown. So I can move up the stairs here. That will get me to three movement factors. And if a building, a multi-hex building, has a stairwell, it has a third level, level two. So for four movement factors, I can go all the way up to level two. Crag. Crag is interesting when you get armour because armour can't enter a crag. But for infantry, they cost two. Brush. Brush is down here. That costs two. Grain and ploughed fields. So this is grain. It's grain in the summer from um, uh, June to October, I think. It's, it's, it's grain. Um, in the winter, it would be open ground. It would just be one movement point, one, one movement factor to move into that hex. In April and May, it's ploughed fields. So whether it's grain or ploughed fields, it's one and a half movement points to move into T1. Walls and hedges a little bit different. So here we have um, have a hedge. Over here we have uh, have a wall. Now that's hexides. So obviously it costs to move from I7 to H6. It costs one movement factor to move into H6. That's the cost of terrain. But we have to add one for the hexide um, cost as well. So it costs two to move into there. Streams. Okay. So streams are where it just begins to get a little bit more complicated. So we have a stream over here. 
Now you need to find out when you begin a, a scenario that has a stream, you need to define find out whether it's dry, shallow or deep. If it is dry, it costs two movement points to move into that hex, just two. And it doesn't matter whether you're coming from a, a, an open ground hex like B3 or possibly you're walking along the stream bed like that. If it's dry, it costs two movement points. If it's shallow, it costs three. If it's deep, it costs four. Now, what about coming out of a stream? Okay, so coming out of a stream is exactly the same as coming uphill. Now we haven't talked about hills, so I guess that's what we that's what we kind of really need to do. And then the, then the streams will make more sense. So obviously C four is a hill. Um, that's a level one hill. That's ground. That's level one. That's level that's level two. So it costs when you move into a hill hex from a lower elevation. First year, so I'm moving into D3 here. Basically, you've got to decide right, how much does that hex normally cost, and it's open ground, so it normally costs one. And if you're going uphill, you double it. So to move from there to there costs two movement factors. To move from there to there costs two movement factors. So this is two, four. Okay, straightforward. If you were moving from here to N1, it normally costs you two movement factors to move into N1 because it's woods but it will cost you four to move from here because it's, it's doubled. When you're moving downhill, it just costs you normal. You don't need to double it when you're moving downhill like that. Okay, so let's go back to the stream. I'm in the stream, it doesn't matter whether it's shallow, it doesn't matter whether it is uh, deep or dry. Moving out is simply gonna cost me two when I go into B3, because B3 normally costs one and I'm doubling it. But just to make sure we cover all the different examples, um, when we're over here, we want to move into B2. It normally costs two to move into a wood, so that is going to cost us four. It's just doubled. And so I'm here in H0, and I want to move into H1. So that would normally be two. Uh, doubled, four. Yep. But imagine that there was a, a hedge here or a stone wall here. So the way I calculate it, and in this sequence is, I think, well, how much does it cost normally to move into H1, which is two? I double it because it's uphill, so that's four, and then I've got to add one for the hedge. That's five. So this hex is level one. This hex is level three. So it's actually a two hex rise to go up into, into Q4. So how do we calculate that? Well, the same, we start the same way. We start right. So how much would it normally cost to move into Q4? It's open ground costs one. It's uphill, so I've got to double it, so it's going to cost me two. And then, for every intermediate level between the one I'm on and the one I'm going to end up at, I've got to add an additional two. So in this instance, I'm starting at level one, I'm going to level three, there's only one intermediate level between us, so I'm going to have to add two. So it's one double two plus two, <laughs> it's four to move from there to there. Coming down is, is is similar, but you only pay one movement factor for each intermediate level coming down. So to go from here to here would cost you two. So yes, yeah, so the calculation for that basically is open ground costs you one, it's not doubled, add one for the intermediary level between where I started and where I finished. Thing to watch out for when you're new is things like streams, streams are always, because they're one level below, this unit here in B2 is actually at level minus one. If he wants to move to here, he's going to level zero, and that's only one level, one intermediate level. But if he's moving from here to here, he's actually moving from minus one to level one. There's one intermediate level there, so that's there he has to pay uh, four movement factors. Next thing I want to talk about is bypass movement. Now bypass movement is a way of avoiding the movement factor costs for uh, moving through a hex with a building or a wood. And it's actually really, really straightforward. So if I was up here on D2 and I want to move to F6, the obvious way to do it 
is to move into e6, which will cost me two movement factors, and then into f6, which will cost me one and a half for a total of three and a half. But what I'm able to do is to is bypass buildings. So essentially, I'm moving outside of the building instead of through the building or around the building. And the rule is that I can bypass one hex side, two hex sides, and that will only cost me one movement factor. If I try to bypass more than two hex sides, then it, then it costs me two movement factors to bypass the building. But one, two, two, I'm counting hex sides there, not movement factor, and you're going to cost me two and a half to move to there, so I've saved a movement factor. That works with woods. Here we go, I bypass that wood there, for example. I can go one, two, three into there. The rule about this is that it needs to be possible for you to see some open ground terrain between the terrain feature and the hex side. So an example of a place where you might not be able to do that would be, well, I suppose this is, this is an obvious one. You obviously can't bypass uh, this hex side here because it's, 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 it's clearly all woods. You can't go around it there. Okay, So bypass movement, very, very straightforward and very, very useful. Right, the next thing I want to talk about is portage. So I have got for you a little light machine gun. Okay. So all squads, in fact, all half squads as well, have a portage capacity. That's their ability to carry stuff of three. Single man counters have portage capacity of one. So actually, this is a good example of this. This single man counter has a portage capacity of one. If you look at this light machine gun, this has one PP written on it, which means it costs essentially one portage point in order to carry it. If we give that to him, he can he can carry it because he it's within his portage capacity, so he can move his full six movement. Another example of that would be this squad here. He's got three because he's a Multi-man counters, remember all multi-man counters have three. This medium machine gun is three. So this squad can carry it normally, can carry it for a distance of four movement factors. If he's stacked with a leader, he can carry it for um, six. So when it starts to just get a little bit more tricky is with, um, is with CX. So when this squad becomes CX, when it declares double time, its portage capacity is reduced by one. It's now only two. That affects how many movement factors are available. So what you do, you reduce the movement factors by the difference between what they can carry and how overstacked they are. So in this case, it's a very straightforward example. He's got a PP capacity of two because he's double time, so it's gone down from three. But he is carrying something that's three. There's a difference there of one, so that reduces his ability to move by one. So although this 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 uh, unit here should have six movement factors, it's reduced to five because now of the weight of that medium machine gun. And there's lots of circumstances where this gets interesting. Here's um I mean, here here they are with a heavy machine gun. It's five PP capacity, so that's two above the squad's ability to carry it. So that reduces its movement factors to two. So this unit can only move two hexes along open terrain uh, with a heavy machine gun. If we, do, if we declare double time, it can now move, um, so it's, it's six in total, but there is a difference of three, so, that, that, so it's now going to be able to move three. One, two, three. If we stack the leader with it, and I take this double time off for the time being, the leader is able to lend his PP capacity to one squad, one squad only. So this squad, with the, stacked with the leader and moving entirely with the leader, essentially has a PP capacity of four. This heavy machine gun is five, so in actual fact they're only going to lose one movement factor. So this group here can move at the rate of five movements or five movement factors. If we want to move eight. We're not going to be able to move eight, but if we move eight, we declare double time. But 
this strictly speaking should increase it. So this, this group here should now be able to move eight movement factors. But we've lost the PP capacity, the, or the PP capacity of the, the single man counter is reduced by one because he's double time, that goes down to zero. And the PP capacity of the squad goes down from three to two. So now we've only got two PP capacity. So we're losing three movement factors. So in fact, this group would only be able to move five, which is exactly the same as what they'd be able to move if they didn't double time. So it's something to watch out for. Sometimes it's not worth going, going double time. And when you're carrying heavy stuff, it's almost never helpful to go double time late, only if you do it kind of at the beginning of the movement phase. OK, so let's look at some other um, ways to move. Um, dash is the next one that we're going to have a look at. So a dash is a way of crossing a road somewhat more safely. Um, you have to be in um, covered terrain of some type. So this is obviously in a building. Could be that you are protected by, um, by a wall or something like that. But there needs to be some sort of TEM protection. Um, and you want to move across the road into another place where you have some protection. So, so I think the idea here is that we're, we're crossing a road, we're dashing across the road. Um, you have to declare it before you move. You can't say one and then they fire at you and you say, right, I'm dashing. You have to declare it at the beginning, say, right, before we get dash. Um, and in this hex here, um, any enemy fire at you is, is halved. And we're not talking about defensive fire particularly in this tutorial but that's that's the reason that you might do it so you move one to there and three to there and the rule is that the dash can only be performed if in total you are going to spend less than or equal to your normal loop movement factors so in this instance this is absolutely absolutely fine because um, he's uh, it's only three movement factors if um, I can't can I see it I can see an example right okay if I was here um, and I'm protected from enemies from the by the wall and I want to do a, a dash from here to here, it's going to be much, much more costly in movement factors. I probably won't be allowed to do it. This guy normally only has four movement factors. It's going to cost him two to move to there and it's going to cost him four to move to there. So he would become, yes, yeah, so it's at six in total. So I can still perform the dash, but I have to declare double time. I wouldn't be able to do that if, for example, I don't know why the Russians would have an American medium machine gun, let's just assume they have. Um, at the moment, I've got four movement factors, so a dash wouldn't be permitted because I need six to get to, to here. Um, if I declare double time, um, it only increases my movement factors to five, as we just discussed, so I wouldn't be able to dash to, to Q8, but I still would be able to dash to four to there. In fact, I wouldn't have to declare double time to to do it. Okay, so that's that's dash, very useful way in cities to crossroads without with a little bit less risk. The next is assault move. Um, assault move is when you move one hex or one location. So um, so instead of I've got move four movement factors, instead of sort of charging off down the road, I only want to move one hex. And so I, I have to declare the assault move before I move. I say, declaring the assault move, I'm moving one to there. And at that point, I complete my movement. You're less vulnerable to fire, defensive fire uh, when you're moving in that, in that way. The, if you were moving from here to, and you wanted to move into this brush, you just say, I'm declaring an assault move, two movement points, uh, two movement factors. That's it. Now the rule about this is that you can declare an assault move as long as you're not using up all of your available uh, movement factors. So for example, if I went to assault move from down here into N1, that move would cost me four movement factors. This unit here only has four movement factors, so he can't uh, declare an assault move. If he was stacked with a leader, he's now got six movement factors, and oops, that's moving together, they can assault move into N1. And the last one that we're going to look at really is minimum move. Now the rule is that, let's get some of these guys out of the way. 
if you don't have enough movement factors to make a move, so we've got this conscript squad here, and it wants to move into G5. That costs four movement factors to move into G5, and um, this conscript squad can't do it. But it can double time and move in without difficulty, can't it? Now it's got five movement factors, so it can move into here, and it's still got one left. That works. What if they happen to be carrying, let's get the old heavy American machine gun again. Okay, so this squad now, instead of, is, 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 is losing two movement factors because, because of the heavy machine gun that it's, that it's carrying. So it only has two movement factors remaining, and it wants to move into G5. Obviously it can't assault move or anything like that, but it, it hasn't got enough movement factors left to move into G5. So the rule is that as long as there is one movement factor left remaining after the portage costs, you can always move one hex. So this unit here can move into G5, will cost two movement factors, or all of their movement factors. Um, it's obviously not an assault move, but they become CX, and they become pinned, which means they won't be able to advance in the advance phase, uh, nor will their firepower be quite as effective. So that's the penalty, but it means that you can always move into a hex, however many points it costs, as long as you have at least one movement factor. Uh, so that's only, it's, it's a one hex move, that's the key thing. So we can always move that one hex. Uh, that doesn't work for terrain that you wouldn't otherwise be allowed to move into, for example, um, water obstacles, Okay, so actually there's lots of things we haven't covered. We haven't covered movement of the type, like sort of human wave movement. We haven't talked about um, searching uh, for, for, for dropped support weapons and things like that. We haven't uh, talked about graveyards, for example. There's quite a few things that we haven't kind of like brought up and mentioned, but I think we have covered all of the most common uh, situations that, um, that crop up in the course of, uh, of a normal game on a normal board. It is perhaps worth pointing out that um, this is a cliff, and cliffs are actually traversable, but not by the normal um, movement rules. Um, so they can climb, but I'm not going to, I think climbing is definitely beyond the scope of today's uh, tutorial. Um, they can, there's also rules for specialist units to scale the outside of buildings, which use a similar mechanic to the, the climbing mechanic, but again I think that that's beyond the scope of the rules that we're, we're covering uh, today. There are other things like a s um, armoured assault that we're not really talking about. We're not talking about um, how to move guns. We're not talking about how to climb aboard vehicles and get off vehicles and things like that. Those will come in uh, later tutorials, but I think that we've covered enough for today.